Well, welcome once again, Body of Christ, to Navigators, where we're looking at Father God, the Great Initiator. So let's, as we do, let's go before the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you, Father God, for this beautiful day. A day in which, Father God, your word reigns preeminent and supreme in the earth. Lord, with the fulfillment of your purpose is our aim and our desire with the church and within the church. Lord, so we thank you, Father God, for what you have prepared for us today to receive from your manna, from your logos, from your word, as we open up your book, the Bible. So instill in us, Father God, the truths that are contained within your word, so that they may transform us and change us from one degree of glory to another, so that we attain the image of Christ within. And we thank you and praise you for that, Father God, in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And amen. Well, we closed last time, if you remember, with this statement. If the God whom we acknowledge is that of a dispensational God, meaning that he would be perceived as a genus God, the God with two faces, then this shows us that we do not know the Father of Jesus. There are many within the church today, within the many denominations that we have formed, that is mankind, who still don't know if God heals. And sadly, even if God saves today, who still cannot categorically say that they are saved when asked, when they are asked, are you saved? And they say, well, I hope so. So what we must be able to see, body of Christ, that this is not all about a dispensational or dispensational ages. Dispensational age, you say, from Adam to Noah and from Noah to Abraham and all of the other dispensational ages that have been handed down to us through our religious training. It's actually all about what the gospel means to you and I today. If God makes himself available or available or unavailable in yours and my life today, then, the, then this is a dispensational God. In other words, it's dispensationalism. Some have the mindset that you have to be in a healing church to be healed. And you have to tithe in order to be blessed. If you don't tithe, you're going under financially. That's a dispensational God. Listen, listen to just how ridiculous that is. That if God, what we're saying in doing that and, and saying that is that God needs our money to bless us. Now, the message of the polytheistic culture is you must tithe in order to be blessed. No. If we're honest with ourselves, we must tithe. Now listen very carefully to this and listen to the heart of what I'm saying. We must tithe to keep ministry going. And this is being honest. Now look, if you will, with me at Malachi 3.10. Because it's here that we find the biblical reason for the tithe. Verse 10 starts with, Bring all the tithes, the whole tenth of your income, into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and prove me now by it, saying, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour out a blessing that there shall be not enough room to receive it. If we truly consider the church where we attend to be God's house, then what this is saying to us is that we're designated to tithe where we're being fed. 
for the continuance of the ability for us to be fed spiritually from the scriptures. And it necessitates that you bring your tithe into that your storehouse. Therefore, then, we need to consider how dispensationalism has affected us. Even if we don't believe in a dispensational God. Therefore, I want to encourage you and to try and, and get you to understand this hypothesis as we discuss dispensationalism. Now, listen carefully, please. We have become enslaved to our imaginations of a self-justifying mythology. A mythology that is a fabrication of personal scapegoats in order to accommodate and to explain our desires and our behaviors. As I believe we pointed out before, these gods of ancient times didn't just appear in the skies and introduce themselves to mankind. No, we, mankind, who had a vague resemblance of the God who was behind the creation, all of creation, who had an interrelational fellowship with our first father and mother, Adam and Eve. And the people of the day said that he was behind everything. So this is the way that we explain our own evil desires and passions and our consistent desire to get even. This is how we will explain these things. Like the barrenness of your wife and for the sickness of your children. We attribute these things to the gods. So what did mankind do? They made those gods the scapegoats for our very own issues. And the question I have for you here is, do we still do that today? Now, in this hypothesis, or analogy, if you will, if our God, the one we believe in, if our God has issues with a people group, a particular behavior, or possibly a gender, or the system, or if our God has an issue with people groups, for there are people groups that the church has issues with, as we know. Now, when we say these things, we want to make sure that what we're talking about isn't necessarily the best way to live our lives by doing that. With all of the issues raised, what we must remember is that we weren't made to be judges. We weren't called or made to be judges. But we want to judge because all people aren't like us. It's inherent within us, body of Christ, to judge and make judgments of people and peoples who are different than we are. With the case being, for most of the time, listen, I want to find things out about you that are different so that I may feel better about myself. So now we have a whole, whole people groups who have been cut off. So if our God has issues with all of these things aforementioned, then we are self-justified in our proclaiming with our having our own, our own issues with them, bringing about self-encouragement. For us then to participate, giving us some uh, uh, legality, I guess, if you will, to be discrim discriminatory, having discriminatory activities called upon by my God in making or showing an unfair or prejudicial, prejudicial distinction between different categories of people or things, especially on the grounds of race, age, or sex. All of these feelings and thoughts coexist to some degree within the church today. We don't have to go very far in some churches today 
for these things to come home to roost. There are varying and various issues in some churches today, like the dress code. Not so much, but it's still there. Or should we allow street people or those so-called bums off the street into our church? Because they smell. Because we don't want people to be offended and uncomfortable. So as you can see, with these kinds of prejudices in, within the church, we're all called upon to make some mental or physical action of exclusion in the church. But one thing is for sure. In churches where these kinds of prejudices exist, it's proof that there's absolutely no understanding of the heart and ministry that Jesus came to exhibit and to show us. How we, his disciples, so-called, should appreciate the poor and the disadvantaged. There are many, I'm sure, there are many in the history of the modern day church who have, who have exemplified the heart of Jesus's ministry in his outreach to the needs of the poor, orphans, and the widows. The facts are, body of Christ, that if we say that we have issues, while then aligning these issues with the issues that God has, then it's simply because we ourselves put them there. Without trying to paint the face of God with our own inadequacies. Now it's important then for us to see this, that if our God is judgmental, vindictive, and punitive, now listen very, very carefully, then I am approved. So if our God is judgmental, vindictive, and punitive, then I am approved in various forms of violence, both responsive and preemptive. The gospel in its purest form isn't political. This is why Jesus was crucified, because of the politics of his day. Understanding, if you will, that if the God that we believe in is punitive, retributive and vindictive, then I can believe myself to be justified in being preemptive. Are you following me? These are completely futile concepts to have, but they are concepts within the church nevertheless. We have seen this in modern day history where leaders have said that they have sought God's face and have been able, have been told I should take, I should, and have been told I should say, to make pre, a pre, a preemptive strike. We are just about at the end of a twenty-year, twenty years of military involvement in Afghanistan and Iraq with no apparent beneficial conclusion to either ourselves in our involvement of or the peoples of those two nations. Again, I'm not trying to be political. I'm just looking at this through the light of the gospel or through the light of the pages of the gospel. We are, we are I'm saying I am trusting at this point, body of Christ, in this sense that we're able to see how we've come under the dominion of these many gods and lords that are spoken of in 1 Corinthians 8, 5 through 7. If you turn there with me, please. Verse 5 starts with, although there are many so-called gods in this world and heaven, there are many there may be many gods, lords, and masters. Yet for us, there is only one God, the Father. Out of him is all things. 
Out of him is all things. And our lives are lived for him. And there is one Lord, Jesus, the anointed one, through whom we, the body of Christ, the church, and all things exist. But listen, verse 7 says, but not everyone has this revelation. How true is that within the church today? So what we need to see and understand by the Christ is to see just how we have come under the dominance of these many gods and many lords in our Christian pantheistic theologies. Have you noticed over the past decade how Christians have become divided over political parties and political leaders, putting the weight of their, and their finances of their denomination behind this or that candidate? And now that the pursuing infighting has divided Christians who are, whose supposed allegiance is to be to Christ alone. Within the church today, there's very little resemblance of the church of 2,000 years ago. We've allowed, as I say, these many gods and many lords to influence and to dictate the gospel up to the 20th century church. This now poses a question for you. I pose this question to you. Where does our true allegiance belong? To Christ, right? Or to some political candidate or leader of a political, a particular political party? Search your hearts, my dear Christ, because I believe this will ring true with most of us. What we're saying here is that Christians who profess Jesus Christ crucified, buried and resurrected, and seated at the right hand side of the Father. So in other words, what we're saying is that we gospel professing Christians often rally around some political, social, or moral issues. So the rally, rallying theme around our particular gatherings becomes what is topical in the moment, i.e. pro-life or the LGBTO movement or climate change, which is very important today, or some other hot topic of the day. And with varying degrees of urgency becomes our rally, la, rallying cry of the churches with them becoming the main themes of the messages within the church. So what is the message supposed to be? It's supposed to be the grace of Christ. It's all about teaching the people about the grace of Christ. That's it. That's the preeminent message that we're to go to the world with. What this isn't saying, body of Christ, is that we shouldn't or that it's wrong for us to have a, have a social, moral, or political issue. And if we have, then we're not clearly hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. So what am I saying there? It's not forbidden for us to have ideas, opinions, and attitudes about certain things that are taking place politically and socially, militarily, militarily, militarily in the world today, right? The question is, and here we must be careful and walk a fine line, making sure that they don't become one of the many gods and lords spoken of in 1 Corinthians 8, 5. This is what we're trying to illustrate here, is that our convictions should become subservient to the one God of all things. And with Jesus Christ, through, through whom 
all things exist. This is the one thing, body of Christ, that we must keep preeminent and at the forefront. We can rally, we can speak for our favorite candidates, our favorite issues, the current events that are going on, climate change and all of those things, but we must keep before us that our preeminent issue is serving Christ, sharing His grace with the world. Amen. So we've got to walk a fine line and make sure that we're not making those laws and God's laws and God's over our lives. So this is what we're trying to illustrate here. It's to this point then that the Apostle Paul is speaking to in Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, and then 13 through 14. Let's go there. We're going to Galatians, the first chapter. We're going to be looking, first of all, at verses 6 through 9. Remember, body of Christ, that I'm reading the scriptures from the Passion Bible. Verse 6, Paul is saying, I am shocked over how quickly you've strayed away from the one who called you in the grace of Christ. I'm astonished that you now embrace a distorted gospel. Hallelujah. Hello. That is a fake gospel. We're, we've embraced a distorted gospel that is a fake gospel that is simply not true. There is only one gospel, the good news of Christ. Yet you have allowed those who mingle law with grace to confuse you but even if we are or even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel different than the one we we preach to you let them be under God's curse let me make it clear Paul is saying anyone no matter who they are that brings you a different gospel than the gospel that you have received let them be condemned and cursed. By now, you have heard stories of how severely I harassed and persecuted Christians and how systematically I endeavored to destroy God's church, all because of my radical devotion to the Jewish religion. My zeal and passion for the doctrines of Judaism distinguished me among my people, for I was far more advanced in my religious instruction than others my age. Now what we need to see here, body of Christ, is that the Apostle Paul, Paul is contrasting his conduct in Judaism and the traditions of his fathers with the gospel. Conversely, we should say that he is drawing a parallel between Judaism's perversion of the gospel and of Christ and that of his conduct in Judaism. Here then he's talking about provision of the gospel of Christ and he's drawing a parallel. For you know of my former conduct in Judaism. Now if you'll notice in verse 6, Paul is talking about how I am, I am shocked over how quickly you have strayed away from the one who called you into the grace of Christ. Here, Paul is talking about the turning away from the Father, from the one who called us in grace. Now, Galatians 4, 9. Here we'll see the, the, the Apostle Paul talking about turning back to those gods and those lords that we spoke about in 1 Corinthians 8, 5. And Paul is asking the question here in Galatians 4, 9. Now let's read it. But now that we truly know him and are intimately known by him, 
Why would we for a moment consider turning back to those weak and feeble principles of religion as though we were still subject to them? So Paul is asking the question here, why would we once again be turning to those weak and beggarly elements or to those who are not gods? Turning away from the Father to those who are not gods which in a sense is talking about the weak and beggarly elements. Influencing us. See, they influence us and are causing us to create our own mythologies about self-justification. So this different gospel that Paul is talking about, which he likened to, with the, to the traditions of his fathers, was turning away from the Father. It was causing the people to turn away from the Father. So the interpretation is that the gospel is the revelation of the Father. And if we look at Judaism, Judaism, Judaism was not a revelation of the Father at all. Again, if you will, turn with me to Galatians 1.6. We'll see that again. He says, I am shocked over how quickly you have strayed away from the one who called you into the grace of Christ. I am astonished that you now embrace a distorted gospel. And this is what we've done, body of Christ, by embracing political leaders and political parties and getting ourselves so deeply involved with them that it splits and separates churches across every city and across all of, all of the nations. We see here that we are called in the grace of Christ and not by. Now, the question, the question is, and this is the biggest one to be asked is, what does this mean? We have been called by the one who gave us the grace through Christ to be saved. So what does all this mean? But of Christ, it is so important that we are able to see this, that we are called in the grace of Christ. We are called in the grace of Christ, which means to live as Christ did in the world, with his being flesh and blood. Of course, he was a man. This then is what this what is meant in that he called us in the grace of Christ and that we are called upon to live as Christ did in the world as a flesh and blood man, as we see in John 1.14. So living among us, he was living among us now, this is, it's, it blows my mind by the Christ. The God who created all things came to earth in the flesh, in Christ. And then God, in Christ, lived among us with his being full of grace and truth. This is what it means in the grace of Christ. It's not simply what's known as sermon fodder. And it's not simply a message of what, of what Christ did for us. Now also, the grace of Christ isn't a group categorization. And the grace of God is not a movement either. It's so important, body of Christ, that we understand what it means to be called in the grace of Christ. It means that we are called into, we are called into the animated imitation of the same grace that Jesus Christ gave to all unconditionally gives to all unconditionally every time we're called to be an animation 
in that grace ourselves. Now again, what does that mean? It means to be a doer and not just a hearer. So the observation here is that the dis different gospel that Paul is talking about is a gospel that is lacking in human expression of the grace of Christ towards all mankind. He said, hey, listen up. You have become embroiled in these gods and lords and you have been turned by them from the grace of God or the grace of Christ in which you were called. Hallelujah. So we are called to be a doer and not just a hearer. So we see here that this is what is lacking. It is a gospel that is lacking in human expression of the grace of Christ towards all of mankind, such as tax collectors, sinners, prostitutes, lepers, and the blind, the deaf, and the lame. In fact, all manner of ailments and peoples of all nationalities and creeds are called in the grace of God. Each and every one of us are called to be part of the animation of the vibrancy and the energy of the gospel. And we have lost this body of Christ by becoming embroiled in all sorts of issues that are, we are not called to be participating fully in. Uh, what I'm saying, you know, again is we can have these opinions, but they must never supersede our allegiance to Christ and being called in his grace. So we're going to leave it there today, body of Christ. And I'm, I'm trusting and hoping and believing that you've heard the word this morning. And that the most important thing is that we must consider is that we are called in the grace of Christ to be his disciples. You know, we read of him sending out the 70 and they came back rejoicing. They rejoiced because all things were subject by them in the name of Jesus. And, you know, we have been given a greater authority if you can see it, because now since his death, of death and resurrection and with his being seated at the right hand of the father, that he became the firstborn of many brethren many brethren who are immersed in the grace of Christ. So immersed that we are to spread that grace throughout the world today. Amen. So let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, how we love you and thank you and praise you, God, Father God, for your mercy, your grace and your loving kindness shed towards us and brought into manifestation through you through your appearance in the form of human flesh in Christ Jesus, our Lord, that you have bestowed upon us oneness, oneness with you, oneness with Christ, oneness with the Holy Spirit. In fact, you have called us into unity and harmony with the Trinitarian Godhead yourselves. So we thank you and praise you for that, Father God. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who teaches and leads and guides us into and through the grace of Christ so that we may spread abroad that grace and that freedom that comes with Christ in knowing Christ and belonging to Christ. So help us, Lord, to be powerful disciples, imparting your life, your grace into many others in the earth today. And let this message, Lord, let it go out and reach the world and touch the hearts of many women many men and many boys and girls, bringing them to Jesus out of darkness into the light. We give you praise for it now, Father God, in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen and amen. So, by the Christ, may the Lord God bless you and keep you. May the Lord God cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you and give you his peace. Amen. So until the next time, by the Christ, 
as ever and as always. May I encourage you to be with God, to talk with God every moment of every day of your lives. So until next time, Shalom, God bless you, and goodbye.